John Anderson and uh, Jean Marie. Great Northern Forest time. Great Northern time. All right, guys, we're live on YouTube, just so you know. For uh, John. All right, we are streaming. I probably started streaming a little early, but that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Ken, are you are you, uh, are you going to pass out? Are you going to have a table tomorrow at the concert? Uh, I am not available, but John Anderson is going to be. Oh, he, is he's around? He's coming back tomorrow morning, and he's going to uh, hot spot the phone book down there. And yep. yep. Good. Are we, so is he, are we going to have a table? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Service got a table for us. Good. Is your microphone on, Ken? It is now. It is now. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to, I just was trying to tell the difference on my end, so. Yep. No, it's not. Please. <laughs> <laughs> That's my bail. <laughs> All right. Uh... Hey, are you going to take the podium when you speak? So for the public, we're just waiting for a couple of other counselors to join. So we need a quorum of five. So we're counting on two Zoomers to join us here to make a quorum. So for the contract zone matter. <clears throat> oh, do we need five because of the public hearing on the contract zone? I think we don't have a quorum otherwise if we don't have five, right? Four, right? Four. We need four. Yeah. Right, so we're kind of one or two. Work. Odds are improving all the time here. <laughs> oh, we and we got Jean Marie, so we're closer oh, and closer. Good. Or we're there. We're good, right? You're there. <laughs> he is. That's if I decide to stay. <laughs> I've already told him I might have to leave early. <laughs> no, I can't. Well, Jean Marie, we'll just, I guess you and I get to determine how long this meeting goes, right? Yeah, exactly. So, no talking, just moving us right along. Boom, boom, boom. I have jets flying right over my cottage going to the airport about this time of night too so you hear rackets that's what it is 
They just had an article in the paper about that, right? Out on exactly. TV. And I'm yeah. like, oh, nice, nice. Now they moved it right over the cottage. Good. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Hey, guys. Hey, John. Okay. I'd like to call to order the July 21st, 2021 meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. We have people here in person and also joining us virtually. So thank you everyone. We'll begin with the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, we're going to do a roll call. Uh, Councillor Anderson? Here. Councillor Caterina? Here. Councillor Johnson? Here. Uh, Vice Chair Hamill? Here. And Chairman Johnson? Here. Uh, Councillor Boudier is absent, correct? So we're gonna begin with general public comments. Uh, the people who have joined us at these, this evening and the public are uh, welcome to step to the podium uh, and uh, give us your name and address. And uh, this would be for anything that is not on, uh, otherwise on tonight's meeting agenda. So are there, is there anyone interested in public comment? Um, seeing none, oh, hang on, thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Maura Erickson. I live at 288 Pine Point Road. Uh, I, I'm a little off the cuff here because I didn't realize the meeting was at five. I thought it was at seven. Um, one thing I'm, I'm coming to you guys because I wanted to address something um, that I've noticed this spring and of late is the trash. Oh gosh, is the trash that's on the side of the road everywhere, particularly along Route 1 and the marsh. And, um, and I guess along all of our uh, water, I, I say waterways, but all of our rivers and creeks and all the little places that we have, I feel like, um, you know, a lot of people come to Scarborough for our environment and uh, uh, natural resources that we offer. And I feel like we're really doing a disservice to everyone that lives in Scarborough. I don't know why we don't have like a protective barrier along, particularly our saltwater marsh. Um, you know, I, I think about all the, the chemicals that get plowed into it during the winter time. I think about all the trash that I see when I go by the marsh every day. I think, oh, look at all those white birds. Oh, wait, no, those aren't white birds. That's just all trash. I see blue barrels from the lobster. Well, I'm not gonna say the lobstermen, but the fishing industry, I see blue barrels. If you look closely, you'll see big blue bait barrels way out there over by Flaherty's farm. There are some blue barrels in the creek over there. Um, I think if you, I just think we need to take care of it. I don't know why, why don't we have barriers? Why don't we have public works put up a barrier and on one side, the guys go and clean up the trash. You see tires, uh, refrigerator boxes, coolers, you name it, man, it's there. Yesterday I drove by, there's a huge bag of trash. Somebody, had, it, fall, it fell out of their car. And I don't know when it finally got picked up, but you can be sure it got splattered all into the marsh before it got picked up finally. I live on the Pine Point Road and from my house down to the Clambake, I pick up three, four bags of trash every month. And that's just me. Then you go by Walmart and Martin's, you see the trash that gets spewing around there. I think we should start holding people and their businesses accountable for the trash. I think if you live, if you work on a, a marsh or a waterway like the Stern, the barbecue grill, the garage, Amore on the Marsh, Blue Ocean Seafood, Tractor Supply, um, any place that is bordering a water, they should be responsible. My husband is a digger. He, he's digging up plastic forks and, and little 
tartar sauce cups from Bailey's, this, you know, the little, uh, the bait shed, Salty Bay, the clam bake. It's everywhere. It doesn't go away. When are we going to start holding these businesses accountable to pick up their trash? I know I'm picking it up. I just feel like everywhere we look in Scarborough is trash. And we need to start holding some of these businesses accountable. And I think that I think the town needs to do a better job at protecting our saltwater marsh. And um, thank you. That's it. I, I, I'm not a crazy person, but I, I really I think it's super important. You know, in Florida, you see people uh, be, protecting their resources all the time. You, at restaurants, they have those plastic barriers by the, when you sit outside on the deck, so stuff can't blow away into the water. Um, I think we need to start taking our, our resources seriously. And um, anyway, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak in general public comment? Um, one, one thing, uh, Ms. Ingersoll, could you turn on the lights, please, for us there? Uh, it's one thing we forgot to do this evening, so turn on, turn on all those, yeah, if you could. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, the next item, number five, we're going to review and approve the meetings for June 16th, June 23rd, and June 30th. Uh, I'm assuming everybody's had a chance to read these, so uh, if there are no revisions, I'd like to ask for a motion for approval of these minutes. So moved. Second. Can we do the roll call? Uh, Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Vice Chair Hamill? Yes. And Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you. And I don't believe there are any adjustments to the agenda this evening. Um, seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, I have treasurer's warrants here, which I will sign uh, before uh, the meeting is over this evening. Um, and at this point, we'd like to hear from Tom Hall for the town manager's report. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, quick update. Uh, we have a number of re recruitments that, were, that are ongoing, uh, notably the police chief. Uh, we've gone back out and re-advertised that position uh, that will close August 1st. So we're Hopeful that the second time around we we do attract more candidates. We've also kind of stepped up our game and uh, done some direct outreach to candidates that are kind of on our radar. So we're hopeful that that's going to produce a, a very quality candidate that I'll be pleased to share with the community. Um, hopefully, sometime in late, later in August, uh, our IT director position uh, we have uh, brought back Jen Day. Jen was the previous uh, IT director. And very pleased to have her back on our staff. She's been a tremendous asset through the years. And it's very comforting to know what her skill set is and what she can bring to both the town and the school operations. And we're making great headway on the number of new positions that we're funding in the budget. There's a communications manager position. Uh, there's a position, uh, a full-time position in assessing that was elevated from part-time. And uh, the engineering technician uh, is also a recruitment that will be underway shortly. So we're, we're making headway in all fronts. Uh, I don't want to take Councillor Anderson's thunder at all, but I just want to report quickly on the downtown committee. That group continues to meet. We met again last evening. Uh, and I'll simply mention that um, they were to do, they, they were intended to provide some report back to council by June 1st. Obviously that date has come and gone. Uh, they continue to work diligently and are making great progress. So I think you'll see a formal request to extend their uh, charge till mid-September or so. And at that point, they think they can, provide a full and complete report to the council. Uh, so maybe as soon as your next meeting, you'll see that formal request come forward. I also want to update the council and the, and the community in general. Um, I was part of a meeting yesterday with involving Edge Sports. This was the private sports group that uh, we were working with uh, about a year, year and a half ago uh, regarding a community center concept. Uh, they're still kind of in the conversation with the folks at the Downs. Uh, and I, I guess they're just looking to reconnect with the town and the school as to how the how we might um, uh, you know relate to their uh, really private operation at this point. So it was a productive discussion, kind of good to get uh, regrounded on some of those topics and the same folks around the table. So I'll, I'll keep you apprised of those discussions as they move forward. 
I will mention as part of the downtown, uh, the Downs folks certainly see a, an athletic complex of sorts uh, being a real integral part, uh, not immediately in the downtown, but certainly adjacent to and kind of supporting. It's one of the many items that they see as really important in terms of generating activity and, and, uh, and, and interest. And so no surprise, they're kind of back at the table. Uh, the Eastern Trail project is something that's kind of has fallen back to me at this point. Uh, the town some years ago, and this has been three or four years now in process, uh, but this is a locally administered project. So it's about a $5 million project. The lion's share of funding is state and federal funding, uh, but it's locally administered. So the town, and at this point, I am the kind of project lead on it. And we are still in the right-of-way phase, which has been excruciatingly slow and, and difficult, frankly, but we're down to kind of essentially two different property owners that we're working with. Uh, I'm doing everything within my power and the federal and state rules to avoid, uh, you know, an official condemnation and actually um, taking property to, to allow this project to move forward. And I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll, we'll be able to avoid that. Uh, we are on somewhat of a timeline. Um, the state has given us through the end of the year to kind of advance this. And what they'd like us to do before then is to get to the point of actually going to bid and seeing if we have adequate budget to support the project project is currently designed. And uh, we continue to have very good uh, partnership and support by the state. Um, and I'll certainly do my part to keep advancing this important project. I guess two other things just to put on, uh, put out there. Um, I've talked to council leadership. We are uh, potentially gonna be asking for a dangerous building hearing. Um, this is something that's fairly uh, unique and abnormal. We've done it only once uh, that I can recall during my tenure. This is for a property that was subject of a pretty severe structure fire in Holmes Road about a year and a half ago. And we really need to, um, we're, we've been working with the homeowner ever since to secure the structure uh, and really get a plan, a future plan, long-term plan. And we may well need to go down this road of dangerous building to, to force its removal to make sure it's safe. Uh, um, so stay tuned on that. And last piece, uh, the council met with uh, staff and, and the folks in the Downs about a month ago to hear about the traffic movement permit and how that kind of relates to the town affairs. At the time, you might recall, we talked about the next step being a memorandum of understanding that would start to lay out in written form kind of the expectations and responsibilities of parties. Um, we've made decent progress. It's still very much in draft form. Uh, this would involve the town the Downs um, development team and the state of Maine DOT as well. So uh, it remains to be seen. I'm hopeful that you'll see it in August. And as soon as I have a draft that's worthy of circulation, I'll certainly share that with the council. Uh, but I'm pleased with how it's shaping up at this point. Um, and uh, Councillor Johnson uh, through communications, uh, I think appropriately has indicated that transportation is a subject matter that we really ought to be communicating early and often. And, about and, and uh, this might be a very good launching pad to start that communication. So we'll work closely with the Councilor um, Johnson and, and the communications group on that. Thank Great. You. Are there any uh, comments or questions about the town manager's report? Okay. Okay. Fine. Councilor Johnson. Yeah, Tom. Just you, you mentioned filling some slots, filling some positions, and you mentioned the communication manager. I'm assuming that's the dispatch coordinator. Is yes. Okay. Yes, it is. I beg okay. your pardon. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions or comments? Thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. So with that, we're going to move to item number nine. It's a non-action item, but I want to welcome uh, the chair uh, of the Ad Hoc Charter Review Committee, Nick McGee, to approach the podium and to uh, update us on the, the great work of his committee. Hi, thank you uh, for having me, uh, Nick McGee. Uh, so back in October, uh, the town council uh, formed an ad hoc charter review committee, uh, something that you do every 10 years here in the town. And uh, I'm privileged to uh, have served on this committee with uh, a bunch of fine people. And I'll, I'll say this, uh, the council did an excellent job selecting uh, the personnel. Uh, we came from varying backgrounds with uh, different, different levels of interest within the town and uh, pet projects, so to speak. So it was a great dynamic when you work through a bunch of these issues. Um, so we tackled the charter and uh, what we've provided for the council is our red line review of the document uh, with a bunch of uh, recommendations for the council to consider at a future date. 
Uh, one of the things that we did do um, just as a process and a structural uh, item was we formed subcommittees. Um, and that was to kind of help chunk out portions of the charter review for kind of more in-depth review and discussion. Uh, you can get lost in the weeds in a larger group setting. So uh, anything, um, we, we divided it up into thirds basically, had three uh, review committees, uh, subcommittees look at those, make the recommendations to a full committee. Full committee had, at that time had the opportunity to uh, either take something off the table that hadn't uh, been discussed in subcommittee and then move it out. Um, or they could uh, just take the recommendation of the subcommittee. So all in all, it was a, it was a well, um, it was a very thorough process. Uh, I enjoyed it. Just, I, I wanna quickly just say a thank you to the people that were on this committee. Uh, Alan Foster, Richard Silkman, Annalie Rosenblatt, Allison Bristol, Karen Shoup, Mary Starr, Mike Stevenson, and Michael Wood. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Councillor Katerina, uh, former Councillor Gleistein, and uh, school board uh, member uh, Liang Casalonis uh, for their contributions um, to uh, giving us some insight from where you sit on that side of the table and how it works. And then of course, the municipal staff, um, Tom Hall, the town manager, Liam Gallagher, the assistant town manager and Tody Justice were with us the whole time. And they also brought in that perspective of operating within the town and within this framework and were able to add in a lot of insight as to some of that detail information. So. All in all, it was a great group effort. Uh, very proud of the product we produced and uh, gladly turn this over to you. Available for questions at any time. And I'm sure other members of this committee would also welcome anything. We did, um, we did do extensive documentation of all the work. We have minutes from the subcommittees. We have minutes from the full committees. Um, and I believe they're all indexed for you to reference at any point in time. Feedback was gathered from the community at large through either the website, public outreach. Uh, committee members also provided some outreach. And that's how we really got the ball rolling. We took all of those comments uh, and took them one by one. So anyone that submitted something, it had been discussed at some point. So well, proud to say we were very thorough and uh, we're proud of the report we produced. Thanks, Nick. If you allow, I'd like to uh, turn it over to the council and potentially the public to ask you questions about the work that you led. Um, so is there anyone in the council who'd like to comment or, or, or lead off with uh, questions? I might turn to Jean Marie, who was the town council liaison. So sorry, Jean Marie, to put you on the spot, but I know you're seldom at a loss for words. So I thought I'd start oh, there. Now, now, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to thank the members of the committee too. They did. They did a lot of hard work. Um, it's it's not easy to go through a document like this and and come up with something that people, you know, have, where there's a meeting of the minds. I guess. Um, I, I would hope that as a council, we will work quickly on, on this because if we decide uh, to do anything that has been recommended, um, we do wanna make sure we get it out to the voters because anything that we decide we are willing to take up uh, does have to go to the voters in November. And I, I would defer to Mr. Hall as to what the actual procedure is as far as readings and public hearings and whatnot uh, regarding that. Thank you. Are there, before we move to Tom for details on next steps and timing, some other discussion by the council, are there any other comments from councilors um, about this work and this effort? I do. Okay, Councilor Johnson. Yeah, well, thank you, Nick. I thought you were on a pretty tight ship, uh, watched not all the meetings. <laughs> but the folks, I'll tell you, it was a real testament to the town of Scarborough. If I recall correctly, when we did the two committees, the downtown and the charter, we had 57 people from the or, you know, residents step up and wanted to be involved. To me, that was very impressive. And so, as you mentioned, I think the selection criteria and, and what you received on your team was was uh, admirable to the to the folks in the town that really want to engage. So I thank you and all the committee members and look forward to doing some deep dive in some of these recommendations. So thank you. Thank you. Any other counselors like to comment? Tom, can you give us an idea of you know, your thoughts on timing and process on this? Thanks. Certainly, I think the expectation was, if time allows us to put these ballot questions, question or questions uh, to the voters in November. What that practically means is that those ballots need to be decided um, to allow time for printing, and certainly to allow enough time for absentee voting in advance of the November election by your meeting, first meeting in September. So uh, frankly, that will be on us, upon us quicker than we think at this point. 
Um, having said that, well, in terms of uh, process, there's no extraordinary process. The council can certainly add additional process if it wishes. Uh, essentially, you need to decide which question or questions um, that would take form in a ballot or multiple ballots, depending on the complexity of the questions um, before that date. And uh, I suspect you may want to do it in a workshop format to kind of uh, brainstorm and, and identify those items. I'm quite hopeful that uh, there'll be fairly clear understanding on a lot of what's being recommended. There's probably a handful of things that you want some deeper discussion on. Um, having said all that, I'm not personally aware that there's anything terribly broken in the charter such that if you're not able to accomplish it for November, I don't think that's the end of the world. Um, but as uh, the council's come to appreciate, uh, things keep coming at you. So I would recommend we, we probably do try to convene a meeting to understand the magnitude of the effort first before we decide whether that's possible. So I'll work with leadership um, to try to schedule that sometime in August. Great. So it sounds like that would be a, a meeting and, a, and, and as a next step, a workshop uh, to talk so. about process. So are there other comments or questions about that uh, potential problem? I mean, essentially, this is a non-action item. So uh, committee chair McGee and committee, we, you know, gladly accept your, your handing over your report. Uh, you know, people were making comments about the size of the of the July meeting packet, the 130 page packet, well, 100 pages in that 104 pages was your good work, including very impressive detailed minutes. So it's an outstanding record, you know, even here as we begin on the, on the next step. So thank you for that and everyone on the committee. And we look forward to talking about this in a workshop in the next month and then coming back with timeline and details about next steps. But thank you very much. Thank you. So with that, we're going to move to the uh, um, to order number 21063. Uh, this is a, a joint planning board town council uh, public hearing on a contract zone amendment from the Beacon Group. So I'd like to welcome the members of the Beacon Group to join us at the tables here, as well as planning board rep representatives, um, so we can begin this, this process. Um, and yeah, we'll stay right here. And then uh, Jay Chase is gonna lead us off with uh, talking about the process we will follow for this, for this item. Thank you. And I'd like to ask the Beacon Group members to uh, introduce themselves. If you could welcome again, good to see you guys. So thanks for coming back. But good evening, I'm Bill Fletcher. I'm the attorney for the applicant. Thanks, Bill. Uh, ben Devine, um, the developer. Okay. John Devine, developer. Okay. And can everybody hear uh, those folks okay? Were you able to hear everyone? So so thanks, thanks for joining us. Jay, I'm gonna turn over to you to talk about the process we'll follow for this. Uh, for this step, which is uh, sure. yep. first yep. of the fourth Just step process. Briefly on, on process, exactly. Um, so this is a contract zone amendment, as uh, some councilors may recall and planning board members. It wasn't too long ago that the council actually adopted um, some ordinance amendments that had um, zoning, uh, contract zone amendments follow the same process as a, a, an initial request for a contract zone. And so really the process begins with this meeting, the joint meeting of of council and the planning board. Uh, so tonight, what, how the, the proceeding will begin is a presentation by the applicant. There'll be brief comments by staff. Um, then there's opportunity for uh, comments by the public. This will really constitute our, our formal public hearing on the matter. Um, then there's a response from the applicant based on any comments that have come up there. Uh, then we'll transition into a discussion among planning board and town council. Um, and really with, at that point, sort of questions to the applicant or staff or, or the public. Um, and then there's comments from planning board concerning land use implications of the proposal. If there's any to talk about there. And then we transition sort of into the final component of the evening, which is the preliminary town council discussion of the contract zone amendment from which the town council will make a decision on the item. Um, and really there's sort of three pathways forward at the end of discussion tonight. One is for council to sort of say, yes, continue on on the, on the process, or maybe this isn't such a good idea, let's stop the process now, or the third option is continue, but with conditions, additional items to consider. 
Um, so that's really by way of tonight's process. And then just to inform folks after assuming it were to move forward tonight, the applicant would then wind up going before the planning board as a, as a preliminary site plan subdivision review, whatever the applicable review process is, and then come back through the town council and work through the final adoption and approval of the contract zone amendment itself. Right now, what we have is draft language um, that would need to get further refined. Um, and then should town council formally adopt the contract zone amendment, it would go back to planning board for final subdivision slash site plan approval. Um, so it's a few months in the making with opportunities for public comment along the way. Great. So uh, if, if there are no questions about the process at this point, I think we'd go to the first step, which would be the presentation by the applicant. So we'll look forward to hearing from you folks again. Thank you. Uh, we've had a chance to read through the detailed work and uh, but would love to hear your words on it. Great. Great. Thank you all. Well, again, I'm Bill Fletcher. I'm the attorney for the applicant, ADK Realty LLC, which is part of the same development group that developed the original project, the Beacon Project, which is a 288 unit luxury apartment complex. Um, and I've got a brief slideshow. I apologize in advance to the town council members that were part of the workshop a few weeks back. It's uh, remarkably similar, if not the same presentation as was used then, but it does go over the project, I think, in, in good detail. Repetition is a good thing for us, so thank you. <laughs> Particularly in the summertime. Great, so we could advance the slide. Just the marvels of technology. Paul is running this from uh, Millinocket, oh, that's um, Lakeside impressive. somewhere in Millinocket. Just a slide yeah. prior to that slide. Yeah. That one's coming up blank for some reason, guys. I don't know why. I can double check why. Yeah, we can. Yeah. <laughs> Give me one second. The rest of the slideshow is there. Um, Great. I have it in uh, PDF form as well. So I, I have a backup plan. Is that what you're looking for here? That is it. Thank okay. you. Yep. Okay, so Thanks, the, Paul. Yeah. So the existing project is the lower part of the screen that shows the, the buildings that are currently there. That's the 288 unit project. <laughs> that, was the, that was accomplished through the eighth amendment to the contract zone. Back in 2007, this area, Cabela's across the street, and then on the other side of Payne Road, uh, the Beacon Project was all part of one contract zone, including this 48 units that we're talking about tonight. And so the Eighth Amendment um, allowed for the 288 units, and tonight we're talking about what would be the Ninth Amendment to the contract zone, which would allow, uh, and I can talk in more detail um, later on in the presentation about specifically what the Ninth Amendment does, but it allows for the, the build out of the 48 units. Um, and you can see it's those two buildings, um, 48 units in total, 24 in each building with associated garages. And that immediately abuts Igus Parkway. We can turn to the next slide now, which is an aerial depiction. Mr. Chair, could you follow around with your cursor to as he's speaking? Say that again. Just follow around with the cursor as he's speaking. I was trying to orientate. The... Oh, were you seeing my cursor moving around? I, I was not. Oh, I see what you're saying. You, okay, you want a little more guidance to me speaking. Got it. Yes, yep. Please. Thank you. I, I get that. Yep. Great. Thank you. So that's the aerial depiction of what's what's presently where the blue um, circle or dot is, is the existing 288 unit uh, complex. Um, this project's been incredibly successful. There's a high demand. Uh, my understanding is there's a waiting list, but that they stop taking names. People just aren't moving out. Um, so the 48 units is, you'll see in that the area that, um, I don't know if there's a cursor there, if you wanna show that right along the, towards the right um, just oh, opposite okay. Dunger okay. LLC is where the 48 units would go. And then, of course, on the opposite side where it says New England Expedition, that's the Cabela's um, development, just for frame of reference. Okay, you could switch to the next slide.
that's a vertical rendering of what the build out would look like. And the idea is to be consistent with the same um, sort of natural tones that are used in the existing project. So it all blends. This is really phase three of the Beacon project. So it all will blend and the same amenities will be used by the residents, the clubhouse, the pool, walking trails, dog park. Switch to the next. This, this slide represents really an overview of the financial benefits um, to the town that are um, in, in, for the, in the first section, the annual property taxes and excise taxes, which are annual payments to the town. The taxes are about $615,000 annually. And we estimate that the motor vehicle excise taxes are about $141,000. So in total annually to the town, um, the project is generating, the existing project is generating about $756,000. And the lower portion of that slide shows the impact fees that were imposed on the project at the time it was approved back in 2017. It shows the affordable housing fund, which then was represented as, it shows there as $2,430 per unit. But when you actually apply the, the calculation because you pay an affordable housing payment that's based on 10% of the project that equates to the 2,430 units. The, $2,430 per unit. At the time, the affordable housing in lieu of payment was $20,000. So the total for the project was $700,000 $700, payment to the town. And the remainder of the slide shows the other impact fees that went along with that original approval, totaling a little over $1.8 million. Um, at the time, there's a lot of discussion and study that went into traffic and what 288 units would do um, for that area. Um, originally, uh, the DOT allowed a traffic moving, traffic moving permit that, that um, planned for a whole lot of volume out there um, at the time that it permitted the Cabela's, Cabela's site. We've come nowhere near um, the ceiling of that permit at this point. And in fact, um, we did some preliminary traffic work um, back in March of this year, and it shows that the estimated traffic counts are substantially less than what we predicted from the 288 units. Um, part of that slide shows that the AM peak hour counts approximately 57% of the calculated trip generation that was anticipated, and the PM traffic count is about 65% of what was anticipated. Again, that's just some preliminary work that we did in March. More traffic work, of course, will be done as it relates to the proposed um, 48 units. In terms of school and public safety, um, we've seen no evidence of any material impact on the public safety or schools. There are currently 12 school age residents at the Beacon um, Gateway Complex, and nine of whom are new students to the area. We can move to the next slide. Thank you. So this is the proposed um, proposed project summary in terms of financial benefit to the town. Uh, we anticipate uh, as an estimate property taxes in the range of somewhere to 90 to $102,000. Motor vehicle excise taxes, approximately $23,500. And then I've, I've shown the, the estimated impact fees. And these are really just rough numbers based on sort of extrapolating what the fees were at the time of the original um, Beacon project. The affordable housing fund um, in lieu of payment has obviously gone up pretty significantly since that time. That number there at 116,000 is based on the former $20,000 per unit fee, and it's now 50,000 per unit, as I understand. So that fee will be going up, as I understand, fairly significantly. Let's see the next slide. This is the proposed traffic count based on our preliminary work. Um, and that is the, the traffic count that would be caused by the additional 48 units. We expect around 25 a.m. peak hour traffic and 30 p.m. hour um, trips. Um, that's still well within the 2007 traffic moving permit. Uh, more work would, would be done, as I mentioned, but we feel pretty comfortable that based on the based on the uh, traffic that was generated by the 288 units um, and looking at the, da the data that the 48 additional units is gonna be a pretty modest impact to traffic overall. 
we move to the next slide, please. And similar with the existing project, given that it's 48 additional units, um, we'd estimate approximately two new students to the school system. And given that we have the same demographic of residents, we don't believe there'll be any um, impact on public safety. So the ninth amendment to the contract zone, which is the reason we're here tonight, um, this property um, is part of the existing uh, contract zone that was put in place in 2007. Um, and again, this would be the ninth amendment. The first amendment one through seven really related to the Cabela's project. And uh, some of those got very granular. They really did, related to signage and lighting and things of that nature. So the eighth amendment to contract zone allowed for the Beacon project. The ninth amendment is, um, is exactly um, the same in nature. It, uh, it relieves the requirement of having mixed use within a project, which is a requirement within the Highest Parkway district. And it provides relief from the dimensional requirements within the zone as well. There's a density limit of five lots per net area. Um, so there's a relief from that requirement as well. The lower portion of that slide shows the process that's set out in the town zoning ordinance. There's the re joint review by the planning board and town council, which is through a workshop, which is why we're here tonight. And then it moves to the planning board for its full and regular review, um, at which time, once the planning board is satisfied, it would receive preliminary provisional, provisional approval. And then we'd be back to the town council for further action as it relates to the contract zone amendment, first reading, a second reading, and then a final vote. And then finally, back to the planning board, yet again, for final planning board approval. So that's, okay, that that's essentially that your presentation. my presentation. Great. At this point, are there any comments from the public that shows us the next step on the process, but is anyone here from the public like to comment on what they've seen so far? And I, I know the council at the end is gonna have uh, some questions. So, uh, you know, I'm going to, uh, seeing nothing from the, from the public, I'm going to, you know, jump ahead and see if they, are there some initial questions or comments about, or from the council on this. So Jean Marie, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about your traffic count. Your traffic counts were done during COVID before, um, the major, you know, masking steps and whatever were, were, lifted by uh, Janet Mills and I know most people were still working from home or working remotely. Uh, so could you comment on your traffic counts for March, please? Sure, um, and we're, we're sensitive to that as well. And again, this was really just preliminary. It's all we could do at the time to get a sense of where we were and try to gauge you know, what the traffic looks like. It's so far under what was anticipated, I think in the range of 57% of mm -hmm. what we had anticipated that I think even with things kind of getting more back to normal, I think it's going to bear out that the traffic is about what we had anticipated originally, if not a little bit less, but more work will be done certainly as it relates to that. Oh, okay, so that was going to be my next question. So is there going to be a, another traffic count done or how will that? That's right. This was, this was a one day study just to provide okay. some initial feedback to give us some input to be able to provide to you before we get moving on the process of, um, you know, engineering and, and another work that goes into this. So, so there will be another traffic countdown? That's right. Okay, thank you. That's all. Thanks, Jim Marie. Any other counselors like to comment or ask some questions at this point? Uh, I do. Councilor Johnson? The relief on the net residential, is that a new ask or is that the same ask as before, we just have to re-ask it again. Exactly. Okay. It's, it's the same ask of the same requirement. Do you have any idea what your setbacks are gonna be off Vegas Parkway? I, I haven't seen that detail as of yet, but I think there's, a, there's quite a lot of room there um, and if we wanna pull up that. Yeah, I mean, um, I know the zoning on it. I was just mm -hmm. wondering what you're on the site plan, if you've anticipated how far off, because I don't know what your setbacks are now. Jay, do you know what those setbacks are now for the original 288? You yep. mean how far back the buildings sit from the road? From Hagus, right? That's you know I haven't measured it out. I'm hundreds, I'll do that this week. Hundreds of feet. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, I can try to pull up our GIS. No, so that's that's all right. I thought you had it off top of your head. Right. 
All right, so you'll have that as, as you proceed to the, like the first step of the planning, planning yes. board? Okay. Any others at this point? Don, Question you have one. Council. Don, Go you ahead. have one from Council, Councilor Anderson. Councilor Anderson, please. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties. I'm trying to make things work. Um, so just one question at our workshop we had a few weeks ago, you know, I think a lot of us talked about wanting to better understand the public benefit. And we talked about all kinds of things from affordable housing, workforce housing, environmental factors, and a potential pedestrian pathway or easements. And so when I read the, the paperwork that you guys submitted and in the presentation you just shared, I didn't really see anything new as a result of that conversation. And so I'm just hoping you guys can, again, provide a little bit more clarity in terms of what is the public benefit you're, you're proposing with this contract zoning amendment. Sure. Um, I know there was discussion about um, a walkway, sidewalk of that nature. And um, my understanding is we're amenable to granting a public easement to the extent necessary along Hygus to build out a sidewalk and to be part of that, uh, that build out. Um, as to, you know, greater public benefit, um, the affordable housing payment is in the range of $250,000 and that combined with the affordable housing, uh, contribution on the original project gets it upwards of, you know, that project providing about a million dollars towards affordable housing. Um, those are the, the sort of two key aspects of public benefit that, um, that we have in mind. Any other comments or questions from counselors at this point? We'll come back around this around to this at the end before we decide on what the next steps are. But at this point, we'll then turn to the to the planning board for their discussion on the technical aspects of you know the planning board's review of this. So with that, um, Rachel is Rachel yeah. here? Or who's oh sorry, you're right here. <laughs> I'm just so busy, I didn't even notice you. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Rachel Hendrickson. I'm the chair of the planning board. Uh, with me tonight or here from the planning board at the end. Introduce yourself. Rick Meinking, vice chair. And on the Zoom call, we have Roger Beely and Jen Ladd. So we have a, a quorum here of the planning board. Um, let me uh, just say that um, we've we've seen you before. Uh, we passed your original proposal, and uh, kind of in response to a question that Ken had, um, we also provided the guidance for the subdivision of those two lots that you're uh, here with us tonight to talk about. Uh, and as we looked at those lots, Ken, we we did look at the setback i can't remember what it was but it was it was substantial so um at the same time when the application if if the application comes to the planning board we will scrutinize it again uh we will scrutinize the traffic um we will take a look at the architecture uh we will look at a lot of things as we usually do i i think um uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to just going to make a couple of comments and ask the members of the planning board to to chime in uh, with their own. Um, I think in terms of the traffic, certainly what I would be interested in knowing uh, is how many of those trips are going to be leaving from the Hygus, um, from the Hygus exit because those buildings are right next to the the exit onto Hygus. Uh, and your other exit is on the Payne Road. How many of those trips are going to be on the Payne Road? Uh, as the Downs comes online, we're going to see traffic increasing along Hygus Parkway. Uh, and that could end up as, as a concern. So I think we're going to need really to take a hard look at, at the traffic. Um, in terms of the architecture, I... Uh, I took a look, I took a drive uh, around the apartments. I'm very happy to say everything is as you present it uh, and as you presented it to us uh, several years ago. Um, it's a, a, a quality operation there. Uh, and uh, I think you've um, 
added to the, the town of Scarborough with the sorts of apartments you have there. I think the architecture that you're proposing uh, is a little bit different than what's been there before. The planning board will take a look at it. It's remarkably similar, um, but there are some differences. And uh, you are also proposing the garages, correct? Certain number of them? Okay. Uh, so that's an area that we would wanna take a look at. We've had uh, no concerns have come to us that I know of uh, in terms of what you've what you've done there. So I, I actually look forward to to this project. Uh, so let me turn this over to Rick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wasn't on the planning board at the time of the initial amendment that brought in the beacons. Um, but I too have driven through there and thought it looked really great and nice, nice classy operation. I didn't see any vehicle chargers, so that might wanna be considered in next round. Um, and speaking of architecture, uh, when, if we see this again, um, I'll be looking at, you know, and asking you what changes might have occurred because uh, Maine now has a new building energy code. We have updated it from the time you built this first round. So we're now, on the 2015 edition of the International Energy Conservation Code. So there's some significant changes to commercial and residential buildings. So uh, make sure you're, you know that now and can take that into consideration. Um, and the other aspect of, of this is Scarborough now has a comprehensive plan. Thank you, Town Council, that's been updated. And uh, there's a fairly significant um, language in there about sustainability and the vision that uh, Scarborough has for uh, the built environment. And I would uh, recommend you taking a look at that and making sure that the, uh, your project falls within some of those guidelines or some of the roadmap that's been laid out. I think it's, fairly significant moves toward, uh, you know, trying to have a really sustainable built environment in Scarborough. Um, so those are my only comments. And uh, uh, again, I wasn't here for the first round, but I see the end product and should the uh, council uh, determine this worthy of coming forward, I look forward to seeing it in a, in a site plan review process. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, Roger, can you chime in, please? Sure. Um, I, I don't have much to add um, other than I think this has turned out to be a real quality project and uh, they fulfilled everything they said that they were intending to do from the get go. And um, I don't see any reason why we can't expect that to continue as we go forward. So looking forward to seeing this uh, before the planning board and um, that's all I have at this point. Thank you, Roger. Jen? Um, may I ask a question of the applicants? Go ahead. Sure. Um, I was just curious if as part of the process in arriving at um, these site modifications, the, the additional units that you'll be adding, whether or not you considered incorporating any sort of mixed use development into those buildings that are proposed for the front of the site? Um, yeah, the history on, uh, on the site was uh, originally we were hoping uh, to do commercial. We thought it would be a benefit to the uh, initial 288 units. It, the non-residential component, there, there's so much vacant commercial space in that part of the world right now. Uh, significant vacancies at Cabela's. Um, there is also, uh, I'm gonna just call it the Mark Loring project that's on, um, that's been approved on Payne Road, um, which hasn't been developed. Uh, and so the mixed use component is extremely difficult right now. Um, the economics are such that it's too expensive to build. There are no tenants. 
and the hybrid model of residential above, let's call it commercial, is, is something that we explored, but financially it's, it's, it's not viable, um, too speculative for us to do. So um, it was a bit of a surprise to us. I mean, we, uh, we thought that the, there would be a real commercial opportunity on those outlots, um, but after literally years of marketing it, um, we weren't able to, uh, uh, to find anything that, that uh, made any sense for the development. Thanks, that's helpful perspective. Um, and then I guess uh, in addition to other um, good comments from the councilors and other members of the planning board, I my only other um, comment is just to reiterate some of the the points about traffic. Um, you know, and I'm sure not, this is nothing that you don't already know, but traffic counts in March would absolutely um, benefit from being updated again, sort of post COVID, but also um, seasonally. I know DOT um, is is pretty specific about the window during which they prefer counts to be made. Um, I believe that's like April to October. Um, and so certainly having that um, pinpoint of data for tonight's discussion is definitely helpful. Um, I would just look forward to your, your updated counts when um, you do come back to the planning board. And also, you know, um, you're in a good position if the uh, original forecasts for that overall development that included the Cabela's property and the original build out here were projecting traffic much higher than what you're actually seeing. Um, but, you know, uh, I feel as though we would be remiss on both the planning board and, and members of the, trans the town's transportation committee. You know, we're sort of looking out for Tra traffic impacts overall as many of us are um, and with the downs coming online you know what what may look on paper or in a table as a big um, discrepancy between what was once forecasted and what um, you're now seeing you know some of that differential is likely to be eaten up by um, overall growth since that point in the town and also what we anticipate seeing coming from the downs um, so, um, you know, I think you're in you're, you're sort of an ad advantage on uh, Haggis Parkway where it's somewhat limited in terms of, you know, it's not already a dense uh, neighborhood network with um, lots of driveways and that type of thing. But um, certainly, you know, just keeping an eye out for other impacts that may have come online since um, your initial permitting in 2007, which I know you're all re you're required to do, but those will just be some things that we're keeping an eye out for. So thanks for the presentation. Thank you, Jen. Uh, I wanna reiterate uh, uh, one of the things that uh, Jen was talking about, in, in not just the traffic, but the question that she had about land use there. And I, I do recall, um, the subdivision process and your your hopes for the uh, uh, for having some stores or a restaurant or something there to uh, both serve the the people of the development and to attract some folks um, from beyond that development. And I'm, uh, however, I've heard from more than one developer that the commercial market isn't there right now. Um, it could burst open in a year or two, but right now it's not there. Uh, and you have. Uh, some good lots and a good development. Um, so I'm very hopeful uh, that you come forward. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, we're, I think we've completed our Thanks for hearing. Thanks, Rachel. Rachel there's, uh, Don, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, Mr. Bailey has one more comment, so I just wanted to get squeezed. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, remind everybody, as I recall it, when this um, project was initially presented to the town, uh, one of the arguments for it was uh, the need to have more people in that area and more people would actually create the need for more businesses. So um, I, th I think there's, there's obviously 
a number of approved uh, projects, commercial projects in and around that area, not even counting the village that's gonna be going into the downs. So um, I think there's, there's certainly, um, as long as it's not a major impact, there's certainly a need for, to have more people to support these businesses. So that's all I wanted to add, thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Rachel and the planning board team for your comments and, and your questions and suggestions. So at this point in time, I'd like to go back to the council. You, you kind of heard the, you know, the feedback from the planning board. There'll be the next step that will involve the planning board. But at this point, we really need to conduct a discussion amongst ourselves in terms of, uh, you know, what we are seeing here and how we are evaluating what's included in the application at this point in time. Um, I want to remind people of the, you know, the standard of a community benefit. I mean, that's been um, pretty broadly defined, and I think it's expanded dramatically over time. So I think that, you know, we want to spend some time on that. Um, and also a reminder that, uh, you know, our, our task is to try to define that, but also to, to bear in mind that, you know, we can approve this for, you know, for good reason, you know, or no reason at all. Now, obviously, we have a, you know, well-established relationship with the Beacon Group, and that really helps them in the process. But at the same time, a reminder that we are at a different point now as a town in terms of our development than we were when the initial application was made and the subsequent amendments. So, you know, with that, I'm just going to say I think it's safe to say that what we are looking at now as a standard is different now is different today than it was uh, when we started. So, uh, Councilor or Chairman Johnson, go ahead. Thanks, Don. Um, I'll just start the discussion. I just wanted to echo, I think, pretty much all the feedback I heard. I and I'm in complete agreement with. Uh, in particular, I you know I find myself cooling to the project a little bit. Uh, I I think I've been a pretty vocal supporter of the Beacon. Uh, a couple things that are top of mind of with me when in the preliminary discussions, which I was privy to more than most because I, I was I'm the chair at the time. Uh, we were talking about buildings that were further set back. Uh, I fully understand and respect and appreciate why we're now not talking about those buildings. Um, you know, however, it's it, it's one of the biggest strengths of that development is the setback off of Highgate Parkway. And I don't expect Highgate Parkway to have a facade that's a beautiful neighborhood facade. Um, but there is a reason why in the beginning it was supposed to be mixed use development, right? There is the vision of parking lots in the back and the coffee shop in the front with the apartments up top. And now we're looking at very large imposing buildings close to the road. Um, and I think I could get over that, but I, but I don't feel frankly that there's been a ton of effort to um, enhance the public benefit argument of the project. I think uh, Councillor Anderson was quite uh, forward and direct with some of his concerns last time. And to his point, I haven't seen much improvement with the, the public benefit. And, and, I think a great example is there's exciting things happening on Highgate Parkway. There's public transportation. Uh, there's public transportation efforts under what way? There's there's we have uh, charging state stations are available to us. None of that has been discussed. And I would say, in order for me at this point to say I'm going to approve and support this growth, I need to feel like the the, the public benefit outweighs the the additional. Uh, my additional concern. So right, I, I can just tell you honestly, right now I've cooled off to the project. I support the developer. I support what they're doing and I want it to happen, but I, I, I need to be swayed by a little bit more of a robust public benefit package. And that, and that doesn't need to be outside the sphere of the beacon. There's lots of things that are very specific to that project that can enhance the public benefit of that whole area. And I, it's, and I right now contributing, and I know this is going to be painful and sound disrespectful, but contributing you're required to contribute $50,000 a unit to the affordable housing fund. And so um, not to sound like a teacher, but I'm not gonna give extra credit for doing what you're required to do. And I know that comes out a little bit strong because it's a lot of money that I don't have to put towards public, uh, affordable housing. But to me, that's let's go beyond what's required and let's get something I can be excited about in order to approve this. So a little long-winded, but that's where I am. Thank you. Jean Marie. Sorry, oh, I had to find my own mute. Um, yeah, I would agree with Paul on the affordable housing or as I, everyone's now saying, oh, here she comes again, workforce housing, which is that gap um, just above the affordable, but below, um, you know, it's still, I don't know if you wanna call it lower middle class, but it's that lower 
echelon in the middle class, um, working class. I mean, can we do something with workforce housing? Can I'd like people to get a little more creative and maybe set aside some units that could be kept in that category rather than just throwing money at it. Um, but again, you know, it's just something that is near and dear to my heart as people are, are finding out. Also, I was happy to hear that you are willing to look at the public pedestrian easements because um, the message I thought I got before and maybe I misheard was it was a little bit of, eh, you weren't sure if you wanted to do that. Um, but that to me would be essential uh, for me um, to approve this. And I would want to see what the setbacks look like. I'm not as wild and crazy about the fact that you may be able to see it from the road as perhaps some other counselors are, because I think that's the job of the planning board, you know, to see what sort of buffering and what parking and whatever should look like. But <clears throat> we do want to make sure, you know, that it, it, it stays, um, it stays in, um, I don't know what the word is. I'm, I'm losing my mind. I'm getting distracted by the scenery outside on my porch here. So anyway, sorry. Um, but that, that's, that's where I'm going. So I, I would, you know, add that I am in agreement with what uh, Chair Johnson said and then my own thoughts too. Thank you. Thanks, Jean Marie. Councillor Johnson, would you like to speak at this point on this? Councillor Ken Johnson. Really? Did, I, did I have my hand up? No. Well, no. you were going like this, and I thought maybe. Don, Don Councillor Anderson has his hand up. If oh, Ken I'm sorry, can't, can't see him from here. Yep. John, you go first. I'll just keep I'm, interrupting. I see I'm a big ominous. Yeah. No, no, you're good. <laughs> the direction is good. Thank you. Sir, direction. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Councillor Hammer. I'm not sure if you can see me, so I'm trying to use the raise hand feature. Um, you're a tiny thumbnail uh, on my screen, but that's just <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. that's just you know not not to don't, don't read too much into that. And let's not forget, yeah. he didn't know where Rachel was. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tunnel vision comes to mind. Thank you. Yep. So I'm, I'm just going to echo and support both what um, Councillor Katarina and, and Chairman Johnson just said. You know, I do think there is still work to be done around better defining the public benefit. I think some of the things that the planning board brought up tonight were great. Um, I think revisiting our comprehensive plan and some of the sustainability things that are mentioned in there, I think that's worth going back, revisiting, and seeing if there's things there that you guys see as opportunities. Um, you know, I think people have mentioned charging stations as, as potential places for people to come and charge along Scarborough. We need more of those. So having something like that that's available to the public would be great. Uh, same thing as Councillor Katarina, workforce housing. While, while I think this project is, is definitely meeting the need with luxury, you know, we do have a much bigger, I think, workforce housing demand in Scarborough. So anything that could be done there would be really helpful and beneficial. I'm also happy to hear about the, the public easement and how that may be moving forward. Um, traffic, I think that was talked about. I, I, I agree with Ms. Ladd that, you know, revisiting those numbers, again, given all the other things that are gonna be happening over the next couple of years, I think it's really important that we really kind of look forward and get a good estimation of what the traffic impact's gonna be, even if it's gonna be slightly low in the area. So um, like, like, Chairman Johnson, I would say at this point, um, you know, I'm, I'm willing to move this forward so long as we have some conditions in place that that make sure that we continue to have that conversation around the public benefit aspect. Thanks, John. Uh, any other comments? One more time for Councilor Ken Johnson. Well, put me on the spot. Yeah, no, I, I, I think these have been great comments. Uh, the only other item that concerns me is we have a brand new GMO. Mr. Devine, you know, you sat in on the workshop. We've maxed our permits out for 2021 and plus some. So I'm going to assume with everything I've heard with the planning board in the process that you will not be requesting building permits for 2021. And based on that assumption, I'm going to support moving forward. But if the thought is that we will, then I shall not. So my comments. And thank you, Ken. I'd like to add to that, just try to wrap this up. Uh, I don't think we're gonna make a formal motion or anything, but I think you've heard the feedback loud and clear. Uh, I think there's general support to move forward, but we really wanna see more in terms of the, the elements that would constitute a community benefit. I think you've heard those you know, with some clarity and suggestions. 
Uh, I mean, my feeling is, you know, we rely on you guys are experts. You've done great work so far. We're looking for sort of a little bit more wow, you know, and the, the wow from your first development was uh, the fact that it was large, but also it was, uh, it was subdued in terms of uh, the image and perception. So we've had a couple of live illustrations here that perception is reality. And uh, we're dealing with a with a starting off perception that it's going to be right in our face. You know, two big buildings right in our face, right right on Highest Parkway. So you know that uh, we accept that. And uh, however, the public you know is at a different point today than they were, um, you know, five or ten years ago. You've heard the reasons why we're simply at a different point in terms of uh, the the size and and the pace of development so uh, you know we're going to move forward cautiously but we really need to see more i was disappointed to read things in there that kind of read like we're getting we're taking credit for the stuff that we're doing in terms of taxes and and what we've done with with the phase one work with the 288 units so this is you know we're at a different point we you know we'd like to to hear more from you and see a little creativity um, um beyond what we've seen so far uh, in those in those areas of affordability, um, walkability and access, uh, and you've heard the comments about traffic. Uh, so we, you know, hopefully that that is uh, clear uh, and balanced, but also hopefully constructive feedback. Any any further comments? I mean, we're going to give you a chance to answer. I know you're going to have any other questions, but. Is there any other firmer, third, further comments from town or planning staff? I was just going to remind the council um, before you sort of to close it, there is a formal vote that's taken by the board on one of the three sort of um, procedures. So I just want to be okay. sure. Okay, so can I have a motion then for, um, for the vote on moving forward with direction as described uh, in the hearing tonight? So moved. And do I have a second? Second. I, I, oh. So I'll take that as uh, Councillor uh, Anderson. I'm going alphabetical here. Sorry, Paul. No, I guess, uh, Don, I was just going to yeah. ask if, if we're going to vote on moving it forward, so to speak. A, can somebody, is, Jay, is that correct? We're actually going to take formal action to move this forward. And then B, I would like to hear the response of the applicant from everything that we said before we vote to move it forward. I think you know, I would like to get there. Just I know we're putting them on the spot, but I think it's important for me to know if I'm going right. to if I'm going to I just want to know if we're heard. So, yes. So yeah. I forgot to ask for discussion. So thank you for we'll pause here for discussion and for their feedback. Thanks. There's a, I took in a lot and a lot of really good and helpful feedback there, but if you don't mind just summarizing what those points are, because some of them seem like they're of the nature of like planning board uh, types of things. Um, if you don't mind just providing a summary of what we're to respond. To. So I'm going to go back here to John Anderson. John, can you articulate the three again that we let off with at the beginning of the meeting? The first one was... Um, Gosh, let me, um, so I can go back to kind of my question at the beginning, which was really around affordable housing, um, the public easement, and the environment, the environmental impact. I think those were kind of the three areas that we, re we really talked about last time. And I would bucket the workforce housing component that both Councillor Katarina and I spoke to probably under that affordable housing. So I think getting a reaction um, from you guys on those three to four areas in terms of what additional public benefit you see offering above and beyond what was already provided in the packet and in the presentation tonight would be great to better understand. So to be fair here, I, I don't think we're expecting uh, the applicant to come back with really specific things, but I would think that hopefully is clear enough in terms of direction to give you a starting point in terms of the areas we'd like to see and hear more. And I'd like to hear from other counselors in terms of that, whether you'll all concur with that as the proper and appropriate direction from us at this point in time. John, I'm assuming you're okay with it since you're the, the you articulated it. Others, Paul? Yeah, I'm, I, that's completely fine with me. Yeah, I just, if we were gonna vote to move forward, I just wanted to make sure the applicant understood it. So I'm, I'm completely okay, okay with An, uh, Council Anderson's articulation. Further discussion? I just have a clarity well, of point. Okay. Sorry, let's, uh, Councilor Johnson then, Councilor Catarita. Just point of clarity. Uh, 
Jay, I don't have it up in front of me. There are three three bullets here that that were three options. Yes. Is that correct? I just don't know how we accommodate three options with one vote. So help me out. Well, so your one vote would be one of the three options. And as I'm hearing it, so I'll I'll read you yep. from the ordinance what the three options are, what I and the option I'm hearing in this discussion. Okay. See if uh, we're all on the same page here. So option one is um, to withdraw the request for contract zone. That's okay. option one of council. Option two is to continue to process the request for contract zone with or without modifications suggested by the council. Okay. I'll say that's the one I'm hearing. Yep. Uh, three is to revise and resubmit the application for contract zoning. Um, I do want to just make note of, and Tom just reminded me, the vote of the council um, is direction of the council, but it's a non-binding vote. Okay. Right. The, the, the contract Wait. zone doesn't become binding, binding until you get through your first reading, future public hearing, second reading, okay. all that good stuff. So thank you. So to repeat again, to continue the process, to process the request for contract zoning with or without modifications suggested by the council. We're suggesting modifications that were articulated previously by John Anderson. Those would be the modifications that we're looking for the applicant to come back on, but we would. But so still moving forward. Correct. And that's the, that's Jim Marie, go ahead. And then we'll see if we can't battle our way through to actually voting on this thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just would remind my fellow counselors that when you vote tonight, you're not saying, Oh yeah, we're great. This is good. Let's move forward. I E you know, it's a done deal. That's not what we're doing. What we're doing is we're saying, okay, we like what we're hearing. This is what we want to see, but we're willing to move it forward to some further steps. Doesn't mean we're going to approve it because we may, you know, we may spike it. I'm not saying we will, but you could. That's one of the options. But, you know, just remember that this, this vote here is just, do we continue this process or not? So just, I, I was just hoping to be helpful. Any further discussion on this before we take the vote um, on, on the measure that we described with the modification that again, that is to continue the process, the request for contract zoning with modifications as suggested by the council and articulated uh, previously. Okay, with that, I think we're ready to vote. Was that a motion? It was. Oh, so, we yes. This, didn't we? Yeah. yeah, then you said stop, and then we went back and forth. And... Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Vice Chair Hamill? Yes. And Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you, that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, applicants. Appreciate your coming this evening and for hearing us out. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks. And members of the planning board, I'm going to put you back as attendees. Thank you. Thank you for coming, both of you, or coming to Zoom land, my Zoom land. And thanks, planning board. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot. All right, we're moving on to old business now. Um, and oh no, I'm sorry, we have one more uh, public hearing. This is uh, order number 21 064, uh, public hearing and action on the request for a special amusement permit from DJIJR, also doing business as Salty Bay Seafood, located at 68 Jones Creek Drive. So, with that, um, can we hear from Tody in terms of the application? Yeah, the, uh, as noted in the um, packet, the application is complete. Uh, um, abutters within the 200 feet of the property were notified. Um, I did not receive any emails. I don't know if the council received emails or not. Um, there were a total of 17 notices that were sent out. Uh, the applicant did apply back in 2017. However, at that time, the applicant re withdrew their request. Um, and as noted in the uh, cover sheet, the, there have been noise complaints made regarding this establishment and have resulted in police visits um, there as well. So I'd like, I think I'd like to begin by hearing from the applicant. I know Ms. Ingersoll is here. We'll 
yeah, if you'd like to uh, approach the podium and then we'll get uh, feedback as well from uh, from the other from other residents, if there is some. Thank you. Please introduce yourself and Sir, tell us your address. Hi, my name is Cindy Ingersoll. I live at 66 Jones Creek Drive. Um, I'm here on behalf of DJIJR Incorporated. Our business is Salty Bay Seafood Takeout and Tavern. Um, we are here to request a live entertainment permit. What we are hoping to do is to work with some of our local acoustic bands, Paul Connors and his wife, um, Bob Campbell, to come in on Saturday evenings from five to eight. Um, yes, there have been, in fact, noise complaints at our facility simply because there had been a bit of miscommunication. In the past, I have worked with um, Jim Butler, Katie Foley. Um, it was our understanding that live entertainment without a tent and hosting privately did not require a license. It's neither, I mean, at this point, it is what it is. Um, the police have been called to our facility twice. Once at 1.43 in the afternoon for an acoustic singer um, playing at a birthday party. Uh, it was what it was. Um, it was a birthday party for a 60th birthday party. I absolutely was not going to tell their nephew he could not play at my facility. It was 1.43 in the afternoon. Um, the second time that the Scarborough Police Department was called to our facility was, again, my part, um, having Paul Connors and his wife um, at our facility for a 60th wedding party, of which I was not permitted. I do now understand that. I guess I don't really understand. And I reached out to the board a few times. I've come up um, to Mr. Hall's office, left messages, trying to clarify if it's private, do I need a permit? If it's not private and I don't have a tent, do I need a perfect permit? So anywho, that was the confusion. Um, both times they came to our facility, it was, it was deemed that um, the noise was not excessive. It was neighbors being neighbors. They were doing their, diligent, their due diligence, off they went. Um, I'm just looking to have, you know, Mr. Connors um, come on Saturday evenings from five to eight. He and his wife, they're wonderful. So that's that. Okay. They're a, lot, they're a cover band. They do like 60s, 70s, 80s. <laughs> they're great. So Thank that you. was that. Thanks very much. Yeah. Are there members of the public who'd like to speak? Thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. My name's Diane Butler. I live at 9 Avenue 4 uh, in the middle of that street. And we called one time and it might've been just one person, but it sure sounded like a lot more than that. The constant bass, my husband is extremely ill. We had our windows closed and the AC on, we could still hear it. I thought it was karaoke, it was so bad. <laughs> we could hear the music, we could hear the words. It's a quality of life issue down there in top Pine Point. If you haven't been down to see the traffic, the cars, the big trucks all over the place, you can hardly pull out of Avenue 4 without having an accident. I was curious to hear that they asked for a permit in 2017, uh, which they then withdrew because they had a party planned and they had a party going on July 15th, 2017, and then recently posted on that on Facebook with somebody saying totally worth the $100 fine. Now, I'm a taxpayer in this town, and it really bothers me that we don't have a good neighbor and the police department has to get involved. I'm sure they have other pressing concerns, but we have a neighborhood down there, and now we have a biker bar. And they go out there and they rev. Maybe they close at 9 o'clock or 10 but there's always repercussions from whatever happens. And I believe it's been more than twice that police officers have responded. I'm not the kind of person that picks up the phone and calls the police. I'd rather go down and talk to these people. They're not reasonable. They call our friends dykes. Do I need to say anything more than that? I really request that this permit be denied for recurring violations 
of legal laws in this town that are to protect the community. And if they were good neighbors, people would respect that, but they're not. Please vote against this permit. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public uh, members of the public who'd like to speak this evening, please approach the podium and introduce yourself. A couple of comments are, um, I'd like to just to remind people, number one, uh, we wanna make sure the comments are directed toward the council, members of the council, not to individuals. And number two, uh, obviously we wanna make sure we're respectful in our language. Thank you. My name is Marie Waterman and I had property at 74 Jones Creek which is the house next to um, Salty Bay. Not next to it, but the house next to that. Um, so our concerns are, they're only gonna be doing from five to eight on Saturdays. If this gets um, approved, is that gonna open the door for them to have it on Thursday night, Friday nights? Uh, you want to respond to that? Okay, so it wouldn't open the door for any other nights. Um, Thanks, Tori. Thank you. Oh. But if they have private events, that does not fall under the special use permit. Okay. Yeah. Because the bar wouldn't be open at that point in time. It would be a private event. They would have to post on the. Tori, can you put your mic on, please? Oh, so sorry. Uh, they would have to post that it's a private event, not open to the public and they would not okay. be able to um, sell or serve liquor in their, in their tavern, but they could host a private event. Okay, without- But they would still have to follow the good neighbors ordinance as well. If they had somebody come in and play music, they still would require to be in compliance with our good neighbor ordinance. And what is the good neighbor ordinance? They have um, where the music has to be off by a certain time. They, have, they can't have loud music. Okay. Well, they're talking about amplifying the music. I think she said acoustic, um, which is um, in the paper that we got. It says if a musical performance will be electronically amplified, and it says yes. Any other comments, ma'am? Uh, yes, I have more. Okay. So I just, you know, wanted to let you know that it does say on this form that the music is going to be amplified. I noticed that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And um, so once they, if this is okayed, and they do this on Saturday nights, if the noise and the crowd gets too much, do we have any recourse as to get it stopped, or will Point we just have to deal with it once it gets okayed? Go ahead, Chairman Johnson. Point of order. I, I hate to disrupt this, but this we, this is not. We can address the Q and A afterwards, but this we need to have the public comment, and then we'll address the issue on the table amongst ourselves. And I apologize to the speaker, but that's we need to have public comments to stuck to just the public comment. Oh, yes. So I can't ask questions because <laughs> we want. I mean, we want to know about the traffic. Where where is everybody going to be going to be parking? They're going to be parking down all the avenues. Um. Are they going to be parking in our property? And, you know, as far as restrooms go, is, is there going to be adequate restrooms for so, all these people so, that uh, are coming think, Saturday nights? Uh, Ma'am, I think the, the feedback that you were just given is uh, this, this is time for you to make a public comment, a public statement. We don't typically do Q&A during public comment. We'll have a discussion okay. among the counselors and um, the town staff to address a number of the questions that you've, you've pointed out, but it's not a time, it's, it's not like a courtroom where okay. you're gonna be cross-examining, okay. okay? Well, we have concerns as to where the band's gonna right. be set up. We have concerns about the traffic yep. and we have concerns about the people milling around. I mean, we have five bars in less than a mile radius down at the point now. Okay. And now they wanna do a live band. So our concern is, the noise, the traffic, and um, I guess that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Again, just a reminder, our, we're trying to focus on this particular permit, and we know there are, are surrounding issues about about the part of the neighborhood. So we, we're, you know, right. we appreciate that, okay. but we're just yeah. trying to address the instant question here. Okay. So okay, because there there's already live music down I understand. at the bait shed, right? And 
you know, our houses are right in between all that. I know. So. I live in Pine Point. I, okay. I believe me, well, I understand so, so, this very well. And uh, the other counselors do as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Duly noted. Next speaker, please. Next comment from the public. <clears throat> My name is uh, Tony Ionetti. I live at 7 Avenue 4. <clears throat> uh, as a neighborhood, uh, we uh, wrote down, uh, we submitted a letter to the, the council a while back. And uh, I just want to read a few excerpts from there, from this letter, uh, you know, just maybe expressing some of our um, thoughts. Um, um, we've repeatedly expressed our support for the thriving of small businesses in our neighborhood. Uh, when corresponding with the town hall or the police, we support all local restaurants and bars. Other restaurant owners have made concessions, plans to create alliances with neighbors. While we want the owners of Salty Bay to run a successful and respectful business, uh, it's not always been um, yeah, uh, very, uh, a real good relationship. You know, it seems like it always kind of gets a little testy. So, um, and, you know, there are concerns about um, the traffic with it's sort of been expressed, you know, where are people going to park and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, and as far as noise ordinances, um, you know, you know uh, there is an ordinance, but what is, I don't know exactly what it is, you know, 200, uh, 200 feet, now, who is it that uh, is responsible for monitoring that sort of thing? You know, uh, is, is a question that I guess we should talk about. Um, and uh, so basically that's, again, we don't want any hard feelings. We don't want any hard feelings at all. Uh, we want, want the, the establishment to survive and, and to prosper. It's just that, um, you know, it is a neighborhood. We consider it a neighborhood. And, uh, you know, if, you know, the traffic, you know, is excessive, then it affects the neighborhood. If the noise is excessive, it affects the neighborhood, you know, the feeling of a neighborhood. Okay. Um, Thank you. And, Again, I just, just, to, just a reminder, uh, could you just state your name and your address again, please? Okay, it's uh, Anthony Ionetti at 7 Avenue 4. Okay, and the com let's try to make sure that we're, the comments are being directed to the special amusement permit. So I know oh. we're talking about traffic and, and okay. noise in general, but if you could uh, make sure your comments are directed to the to the application. Oh, can you explain what you mean by that? They're applying for a special amusement permit right. to allow music for one night a week. If right. you could just speak to that um, and wrap up your commentary, okay. that would be helpful. Okay, so uh, my Thank question you. is, uh, again, I guess it was reiterated, um, it's just for one one night a week, non amplified music. Is that uh, is that how it is presented? That's what we understand. Yeah, okay. that's no. It was, Tony, that is amplified music. Is that correct? Yes, she did okay. put on her. Can I may speak? I guess that just confused me. If they have a guitar and a microphone, I assume that is considered amplified. I'm not talking about the speakers that are the size of the tables. It is two people singing. Okay. So does that answer your question? Okay. If, if that is the, 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 you know, if that is truly what takes place, uh, then it, it is different than what we have been accustomed to hearing. So thank you. That's... Thanks for your comments. Other question, other questions or comments? Uh, I mean, other commentary from the public in terms of this issue? Um, what I'd like to do at this point is uh, to turn then to a discussion uh, among the counselors. Uh, we know there are numerous issues. You've highlighted a number of things. So let's just hear from other people in terms of their, their feelings on this particular application. I have a comment. Councilor Johnson. Are you, are you putting this forward as a motion before you have a discussion? Move the, yes. Okay. Move the um, do I have a motion to move this forward? So moved. And is there a second? I second that. Okay. And is there a discussion? Ms. Katarina. Yeah, um, I will not vote to support this. Um, I, you know, I was disturbed by what I read in the police reports. 
Um, I know some folks who live down there who've chatted with me a little bit about it informally. Um, I, I, no, I, I, no, it's just a no. So, okay. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Jean Marie. Others? Councillor Johnson? I have a comment. I just need to have Tody keep me, keep me above board here because I heard something said that I think is going to be misconstrued that there is no permit needed for a private party. And I sitting here in the 30 seconds can come up with about 50 ways to get around this with that statement alone. So I want to make sure that everybody understands that a private party is defined as that bar is closed. There's no alcohol served or at least from the bar and still any neighbor can pick the phone up and call the police. That's correct. Cause they okay. have to comply with a good neighbor ordinance. Right. Uh, I'm not going to support this either, o only because I frequent the place. I think you've got a great place. We sit out there in the Cat Adirondack chairs, watch the river. Uh, I, I wish you success, but the neighbors are way too close, and there is noise there. It's not your fault. It's it's what the area has turned into. Very unfortunate it has turned into. I've been in town for 35 years. It's a different world down there. Don't know how it happened. We're going to be looking at it, but I I'm not going to support this. Thank you. Chairman Johnson. Chairman Johnson is recognized. Thank you. Um, I was on mute. Uh, first, I just apologize to the, uh, the member of the public. It's just important that we keep this going at a certain pace. And um, the ordinances, the special amusement permit, and the way it interacts with our good na neighbor ordinance is very confusing. So as a member of the public that steps in, I know there's a lot of questions. So the only reason why I called the point of order is because these questions get very convoluted by doing them verbally back and forth. And I just wanted to move this along and it's not appropriate for public hearing, so to speak, but I did want to apologize. It wasn't trying, I wasn't trying to be aggressive. Uh, with that being said, the, we have a good neighbor ordinance and it's very simple. If you hear music, if you, if something is too loud, if something is can be heard 200 feet off our property line, you're uh, off somebody's property line, you can pick up the phone, you can call the police and say that they are being too loud. That's our good neighbor ordinance. It's separate and distinct from our special amusement permit. And what this special amusement permit is asking for is an exemption from that ordinance on Fridays, or I believe it was on Saturday. And so it gets a little convoluted because there's two pieces of paper and it, it, as a neighbor who only hears about this when it affects you, it's confusing. I encourage any neighbor, if they are being too loud, to pick up the phone and call the police. And I know that's a waste of our resources. It's fr frankly, it's a colossal waste of our resources. But the first thing that we do when we get these types of requests and possibly denials is we ask the PD for a copy of their report so we can see in writing what has actually happened and what is, what is in, in writing. And that's important because otherwise we need to sift through some neighborhood dynamics that really we can't be super concerned with unless we have evidence and a police log. With that being said, I am a no on this request. Okay, I think we've heard from everybody. Um, uh, John Anderson, did you did you give us a position on this? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm also going to be no on this tonight. You know, I think you know, looking at the application in and of itself to to ask for live music Saturdays from five to eight doesn't seem like a big ask, but hearing from the concerns from the, the community tonight, and then also the police log that was provided to us, I would just urge that the business um, maybe reach out to other businesses in the area to understand what they're doing to engage the neighbors, like one, one of the commenters made tonight, and figure out how you can maybe partner better with them and come back next year and ask for something like this. But for tonight, I'm a no. Thank you. And I'd like to try to wrap this up. Uh, thanks to everybody in terms of uh, Chairman Johnson. I'm sorry, that's I, I, I'm taking a second turn. I just I think it's important to piggyback on that to give people in the audience some context. Uh, this council has pretty aggressively asked our police department to start enforcing Pine Point better and more uh, succinct to the letter of our law. So to be really clear, this isn't going to go away. Uh, it, it would not be wise for the applicant to ignore this. Um, the wisest move here is for everybody to get in one room and sort through some of this and come to an agreement because we are not going to stop asking our police department to enforce Pine Point. In fact, we are putting pressure, as much pressure as we can as a body, for them to enforce it more, to write more tickets, and to take everything a lot more seriously. So this isn't going to go away. 
So ignoring this will not work. The best solution for everybody is you got to get together. We got to let some bygones be bygones and, and everybody needs to start behaving better because it's, there's going to be a bunch of losers and no winners in the situation if this is ignored. Thank you. The only thing I'd add is that uh, I'm a longtime resident of Pine Point. I have relatives that live on Jones Creek Drive. I also frequent uh, the tavern at Salty Bay. I enjoy your clam cakes half for years. So I, I like riding my bike down there. I'd love to see you guys continue your business. This particular thing, you, you kind of can hear the sentiment. We tried to focus the discussion on that tonight. So apologies to those who felt that we maybe were not, not uh, sensitive to your other issues, but we really have to deal with what's in front of us. And with that, I think we're ready for a vote. Councilor Anderson? No. Councilor Katarina? No. Councilor Johnson? No. Uh, Vice Chair Hamill? No. And Chairman Johnson? No. Motion fails. Thank you. Moving on to old business, order number 21-052, second reading on the 2021 bond order for municipal and school capital improvements. And with this, I think we're going to turn to Tom to give us a, a tee up on this. Thank you, members of the public, for joining us. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, this matter uh, came to the council a, really almost a couple of months ago. We were preparing our typical spring bond issue. Uh, Councilor Clucci, who's uh, chairman of the Finance Committee, uh, wanted to spend a little more time and, and, uh, and did, in fact, uh, the Finance Committee took the matter up. Uh, there's just a number of uh, complicating factors. Uh, essentially, what we're coming forward with are projects that have already received certainly budget approval. Uh, and through that process, uh, the councilors may recall that we indicate what the method of, of uh, finance is. Uh, some items in the capital budget are appropriated. Uh, many others are uh, bonded or some other method of finance. Um, the list of projects that come before you this evening, you'll note span probably three or four different fiscal years. Uh, most of them are more recent. Um, the sheet that you're looking at right there is an entire list of the actual projects uh, for which we're looking to secure bonding authority for. Um, so you'll see that they, uh, down at the bottom of the list, uh, there's some as far back as fiscal year uh, 2017 in this list. And just, if you allow me just for a second, uh, the nature of capital projects and items, uh, many times uh, they don't respect a fiscal year for all sorts of reasons. The scope and the magnitude of the project, uh, other external factors causing delays. And so it's not surprising that we are uh, looking back to prior budget authorizations um, and then finally doing a project at some later date, much later in some cases. Uh, in almost, uh, all parts of this uh, of this proposal, these are projects or items that we've actually already bought and paid for. And so we're looking to reimburse the town. Um, um, and, and again, this was the method of finance that was uh, directed as part of, the, part of the budget authority. I might, uh, Paul, I'm not sure if you can, yes, if you can enlarge that a little further. You want to, uh... Yeah, that's hard. It may still be hard for folks to see. Uh, about two thirds of the way down that list, I, I just picked this because it's uh, it's kind of an easy one, it, and you'll see it. It's the first red asterisk, pumper truck. Pumper truck. Um, with input from finance committee, we've mo kind of modified this form, and I think it, frankly, uh, can be tightened up a little further, and, and we'll work on that. But just let's use that pumper truck as an example. That was a project approved in the FY twenty budget. It also incidentally required voter approval, which it, uh, it did receive. Uh, that project budget approval was at $660,000. Um, because of the nature of that item, um, it takes about 14, 16 months to actually build. These are all custom built from the tires up. Uh, and, and we actually had a, a very big financial incentive for a prepayment option. So we paid a, a big chunk of it upfront. And then there's progress payments and a final payment. So. Uh, for that project approved in FY20, uh, we previously bonded. This council gave us authority to bond about five, 465,000 uh, of that 660. And what's before you this evening is the remainder, uh, 186, 760, if you will. Uh, in this case, there's actually a trade-in value. So the total we'll spend is slightly less that trade-in amount than the uh, project budget, excuse me, the approved budget. 
So that just gives you a sense of kind of one project and kind of the complexity and, and they all are slightly different. So uh, I very much appreciate kind of the uh, line of sight that this display starts to give to um, tracking these things over time. And again, I uh, will be the first to admit that I think we can probably improve further and we'll continue to work with finance committee to do so. So uh, again, we're before you this evening uh, a bit later than we are normally, uh, but this is part of our annual borrowing, if you will. And uh, with this uh, approval, we'll then work with our uh, bond rating agencies to secure an updated bond rating and actually go to market in late, uh, late August at this point, early September. Um, Councillor Cleutry has agreed to be part of our rating calls with the bond rating agencies, which we welcome. Um, former finance chair uh, Hayes was a, a frequent attendee in those calls as well. Uh, so uh, we do recommend approval and certainly appreciate the extra time spent on the matter. Any questions for Tom on this? I know this is confusing. I know we uh, discussed this with Chairman Johnson and others. Uh, Councillor Johnson, it's hard to kind of follow the bouncing ball over multiple years, and it does seem as though uh, these things take a while to get, you know, to get finally bonded and paid for. So, um, any comments or questions? If not, I can I have a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Further discussion. So we can take the vote. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Caterina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Vice Chair Hamill? Yes. And Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you, that's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. New business, order number 21-065. First reading and scheduled public hearing on proposed amendments to chapter 1018, the Town of Scarborough Marijuana Establishment Ordinance. And I believe we've got Liam Gallagher piping in for this, Liam. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Hamill. Um, I, I, I'll attempt to tee this up. There's a number of changes uh, that have come forward. Uh, just to give some background, um, we've, we're approaching the uh, first year of our, our completed license process. And, and through that first year of licensing uh, our marijuana establishments, I think there were some uh, changes that uh, we really are, the, I think that the ordinance committee really felt were appropriate given some of the, the pressing concerns from constituents around uh, odor mitigation specifically. So that's where uh, the ordinance committee started. I think there are some other more procedural changes that we think uh, make sense for the council's consideration. Um, but just at a, a high level, what these changes try to, to enact is uh, establishing some enhanced odor mitigation uh, system standards, um, as well as uh, trying to address the responsibility of when um, those odor mitigation systems aren't as successful as they need to be. So we've uh, also extended uh, some responsibility beyond just the applicant, but also to the property owner. Um, so those are those are really the, the biggest changes here. We've also proposed to uh, incorporate an administrative renewal process for applications that are largely the same as uh, they were initially, and, and that would not require council action. So that would be essentially a staff approval. They still have to meet the same standards uh, that they had to meet with their initial applications, but would not require a public hearing and would not come to the council for action. I do think that one important thing that we have retained in these changes is that either the town manager or the council chair can bring forward any renewal application for council consideration in the event uh, there's some uh, overarching concern or or any really any any reason at all um, they retain that ability um, and then there's some smaller changes uh, we've we've received a, a handful of requests over the last few months from uh, existing existing license holders who need just need to make some fairly small changes to their existing application. They may uh, be expanding their uh, footprint or floor plan within an existing facility. Uh, it doesn't include an expansion of their operation or, or in, in the case of cultivators, it doesn't represent an increase of their canopy or change their license uh, 
Uh, we've also had some questions about ownership. Um, we've had some minor changes to either principles or uh, requests to change whole LLCs. Um, again, the, the property owner hasn't changed, but uh, they may be shifting from one LLC to another for one reason or another. Um, so we're trying to provide a mechanism for those kind of mid license changes. Right now, that process would require a whole new application uh, with associated fees. And so we're looking to, to provide a, a more, um, I think, reasonable fee associated with those small changes. So that's on a high level. Those are what we are proposing. I think that came out of ordinance and I'll defer to the ordinance committee members for any expansion of those thoughts. Thanks, Liam. Uh, with that, uh, Jean Marie, would you like to speak to the ordinance uh, committee perspective on this? Um, no, I, I, Liam did a great job with it. I think that um, the town council obviously should approve this. The, it, it went through, you know, the rigors of the ordinance committee. Uh, we had a lot of feedback from people, and I think these all make sense. Um, this whole marijuana industry is ongoing changes and evolution and whatnot. Uh, the thing that I like, really like about it is the uh, odor, you know, attempting to, to get after that odor issue. So um, I strongly uh, recommend that we approve this. Any other comments or questions from the counselors? I have one. Councilor Johnson. Just to remind everybody, this there's some feedback. <laughs> Oh, okay, John, you're good now. That was him. Yeah, only that the, uh, the the town we hired a consultant to come in and help us mitigate the odor, and this is actually the implementation of those recommendations. I just wanted to call that out, and uh, I think uh, I think it looks solid. It's getting better, and uh, definitely will support this also. Thank you, so, Councillor, uh, our chairman, uh, uh, vice chairman uh, Hamill. Uh, before motion's offered, I wonder if someone would entertain, uh, as it's currently postured, this is first reading and scheduled public hearing. Given the fact that we do have the first round, of, first, first wave of renewals coming in September, uh, staff, I think, sees the value of having this in place sooner than later. And, right. and with that, we can have these renewals live up to these new standards. So uh, if someone is so inclined to offer a motion that would include uh, both public hearing and second reading to be scheduled at your August meeting, that would be in a single day. Yep. So can I have someone uh, present a motion in that fashion, please? I offer a motion to, um, God, I haven't offered a motion for like three years. <laughs> I don't even know how to do it. <laughs> Motion as written, but to add a uh, second read, uh, additional language to say the second reading of public hearing will be on the same day in our meeting in August. Thank you. Perfect. Any further discussion? I mean, one thing I'd like to highlight just uh, as a member of the ordinance committee, we move very quickly uh, from the Bob Bowker presentation on odor mitigation. I think this is a really powerful and important step and I don't uh, want the public to lose sight of that. I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to, that, to having immediate impact. Uh, on odor issues. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and vote a vote a Rooney on this. Second, Thanks. Oh, we need a second. Thank you. Yeah, I'll second. Okay. okay. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Caterino? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Hamill? Yes. And Chairman Johnson? Yes. Yes, Thank you. Thank Mr. Hamill, quick point of order before we yes. proceed. Um, I need to leave the meeting. I have family obligations. Uh, Mr. Anderson is the quote host of Zoom and he has his instructions. Uh, so we should be completely all set. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. And uh, have a lovely evening up there in the great Northern forest on Millinocket Lake. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. You said that quite well. Thank you. Thank you. Millinocket. Um, this is order number 21-066, first reading and schedule of public hearing on the proposed amendments to chapter 303, Town of Scarborough Personnel Ordinance 501. So uh, Liam, I guess we're gonna hear from you on this. This is pretty noteworthy development. Yeah, so um, as uh, people are probably aware, the, the President of the United States did enact a new national holiday on, I believe, June 17th, uh, the, the holiday being June, Juneteenth, uh, which will be recognized on June 19th every year. Uh, again, I think in the pack, you'll see the, the notes. This is um, 
widely regarded as the, the Emancipation Day for uh, African American slaves. And so uh, the state of Maine did turn around and also recognize that as an official holiday. So we're looking to incorporate that into our personal ordinance. Uh, we also did incorporate this holiday and recognize it in the two contracts that were approved last month by the council and fully expect to incorporate in all other uh, uh, collective bargaining agreements. Thank you. Any questions for Liam or any commentary by counselors? This seems like a simple, straightforward thing, but this is really historic. So, uh, and we're trying to figure out when the last when the last national holiday was. People think it was may, may have been Martin Luther King Day. So, yeah, it was. Yeah. So, may I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion. Jean Marie? No, I'm, I'm pleased to uh, support the addition of Juneteenth um, to our holiday schedule. Um, yeah, it, it's huge that we've added um, another holiday um, that, that um, recognizes uh, events of importance to people other than those of us who are white in this country. So thank you. Any other comments? So we take the vote. Vice, Vice Chair Hamill, I don't know if you can see me raising my hand. Oh, sorry, John. Say. Sorry, John. I just had a small thumbnail again. Couldn't see it. Yep. Go I ahead. just want to say, you know, again, thank you to, to to Liam and Tom for putting this forward. I think this is a great thing to do. Everything that Councillor Katarina said, you know, again, this is another thing that I think shows how we're thinking more broadly about social and racial injustice. And I'm glad to see us, us move this forward as well. <clears throat> Thank you. Any further comments? Okay, Tony, I think we're good up to the vote now. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. And Vice Chair Hamill? Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Order number 21-067, Act authorizes the town manager to sign the agreement between Maine, PERS, and the town of Scarborough pertaining <laughs> to retirement plan 3C for future service only for full-time dispatchers. Again, Liam Gallagher on this one. Thank you, Liam. So if the uh, council recalls uh, last month, you the council ratified an agreement with the uh, dispatchers union. Uh, included in that agreement was a change effective August 1st uh, to from the, the uh, standard main state retirement plan to the special plan 3C, which is a, a no age but service-based retirement plan. Uh, the additional costs of, uh, to the town for that special plan was uh, largely paid for by a reduction and a matching contribution to another retirement plan for these employees. So it was uh, largely revenue neutral or, or cost neutral. Uh, this is simply the uh, formality associated with that change. Thank you. Any, any comments or questions on this? Seeing none, I, I'd like to add, this is another good example of the great work that uh, Liam and town staff have done uh, to really economize uh, and take opportunities for efficiencies and cost reductions in how we manage our, our, our benefits. So thank you for that. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? I think we're good to vote. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Vice Chair Hamill? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Order number 21 068 Act to adopt the fiscal year 2022 school, school budget resolution as required by state statute. This is brought forward by the school department. So, Tom, can you help us with setting this one up? I think. Tom, this is, yeah. yeah, this is an annual rite of passage. Uh, the Board of Education is required to reflect the total approved spending amounts, uh, both by the council and validated by the voters across, I believe, 12 different uh, spending categories, if you will. And uh, so this is just kind of a housekeeping piece. Uh, now that all the approvals are in place, uh, the Board of Education has taken uh, action to allocate uh, that authorization across those um, 12 or 13 different spending categories. So okay. you're not approving anything uh, you know, other than what was approved by council and validated by voters. It's just allocating it um, across the different subcategories. Okay. Thanks, Tom. 
Any questions for Tom or comments by counselors? Seeing none, may I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? Seeing no further discussion, we're ready to vote. Okay. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Vice Chair Hamill? Yes. That passes, thank you. Thank you. Order number 21-069, act on the request to approve the remote meeting policy. This is brought forward by the town manager and the rules and policies committee. Tom? Yes, uh, as the council's aware, uh, through government, uh, the governor's executive orders and successive orders through the 14 or 15 months of the pandemic period, uh, public bodies such as the town council have been able to meet uh, remotely and conduct its, uh, its affairs remotely. Um, I think we all came to appreciate the value of that and the convenience uh, given that circumstance. But uh, beyond that, I think there was a silver lining in this kind of forced experiment. Uh, and I think tonight is a great example. We've got members of council that are not physically able to be here, but they are every much in, in every way uh, an active participant uh, in this proceeding. Uh, and similarly, I think the public has come to really enjoy the ability to um, connect into these meetings in the same format. So to that end, uh, the, this, this legislative session uh, did include a statute uh, for the first time that allows remote participation. It does require the adoption of a policy at the local level that certainly is consistent with the statutory uh, framework, but it also gives latitude for us to create some additional detail should we choose. Um, what's before you is a policy that I prepared based on the statutory direction. I will note uh, the statute is, uh, a bit light on a couple of details. And so worth noting, I think in this policy, uh, the, the basic premise is that the expectation of members of a public body is that you be here physically present when possible uh, for purposes of uh, reasons of illness or physical inability because you're on vacation or otherwise unable to attend the meeting or other acceptable reasons for remote participation. But the expectation is that you be here in person. Um, the law does not necessarily speak to uh, uh, the expectation of the public. So you'll note in this policy in, uh, in the latter stages, uh, it's actually section 5B, and I will read, uh, it is the intention of the town council to allow members of the public to participate remotely in all public proceedings when technology and circumstances permit such participation. So the expectation is clear that we wanna afford this opportunity when we can. And I had to put the caveat of circumstance and technology. Um, uh, the other thing I would note, uh, the statute um, curiously does not allow the council to dictate for other public bodies of the town um, what the policy for remote participation is. They must take action each and every one. So the purpose section here, uh, I wrote it in such a way that there, I hope is a very clear and direct message to all the other town boards and committees, which states in part, to ensure consistent application of this policy, the council intends for its subcommittees and all committees, boards, task, force, task forces, and subcommittees of very standing or advisory boards uh, of the town to comply with this policy and approve such a policy by a further vote of its members. So I'm working with staff uh, who provide staff support for these various boards and will be modifying a similar policy should you pass this and encouraging as soon as possible that uh, all the other public bodies of the town have a policy in place that permits such uh, participation. So that's a long-winded way of saying this will enable us to continue. Um, and, and effectively we'll be working in a hybrid meeting fashion uh, for every proceeding. Um, and in many cases you may all be present, uh, but members of the public, staff, um, and, uh, and other interested parties may be connected re remotely. Uh, I guess the final piece I'd say, this policy is silent to it, but the other, I think, uh, appreciation I have is the ability through the Zoom platform to live stream on YouTube, and then the archive and retrieving capability of, our, of YouTube, I think is something that has been a, a huge positive out of this. And this system and what we're proposing here will enable us to do that going forward. Thanks a lot, Tom. Any comments or questions from the council? I have a question. Yeah, Councilor Johnson and then Jean-Marie. 
And I apologize. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't read the, the detail on, on this. I was too buried in all the other stuff in the packet. So uh, does, this re, uh, does this address the Zoom? Uh, the real life case. I went to watch the finance committee on the bonding, mm -hmm. and it was not streaming. That's right. Was that because the policy wasn't in place, or was there some technical difficulty? Because that was my first thought. I know we're going to be doing a policy for mm -hmm. this. Uh, does that address this? I heard you say that. Yes, all it does. Yeah, the, committees. Okay. The intention will be for all committees, even committees of the council, to do a, a hybrid approach. So okay. it is available through live stream. This past finance committee, uh, Chairman uh, Clucci said we will have an in-person meeting. So we did not provide a, uh, a Zoom link. Um, okay, so was that a caveat to this policy? I mean, I, I was under the assumption that would, there would always be a Zoom link or is that superseded? They, they will, that's okay. what this policy does. So okay. I, that helps with the liaison roles also. For sure, Right. Okay. for sure. Right. Uh, uh, incidentally, that meeting was live streamed. But, uh, it was broadcast live on SCTV, but oh. that's, I never many, even thought of that. For many folks, that's an antiquated and not right. a convenient way of <laughs> viewing. Um, and then, of course, it took us a couple of days, but we've got it up yep. uh, and available on our website. So, okay. great. We're getting better. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for your question, Ken. Jean Marie, did you have a comment on this? No, I was just going to say uh, thank you for doing this. I, I was thrilled that the state's allowing for remote participation. Because I do think it expands uh, dem democratic involvement by our, our, our folks, our constituents. Um, having been on the council for a long time, you know, just this last COVID year and a half, ugh, um, having the Zoom, it's amazing how many people are able to attend or are watching us on YouTube and are, you know, commenting. Where before, you know, you could watch it on SCTV, but that was kind of sketchy. And, and it's just easier for people to watch in real time if they wish or, or see it later. Um, or as Tom said, it makes for great archives too. So I, I'm just very excited about this. So thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, so I, I just to add to this, uh, I mean, it's amazing to see what happens in a crisis. And, uh, you know, I guess out of necessity, we just vaulted forward in terms of connectivity and our ability to record and engage people. And uh, so, you know, there were really some tremendous things. I mean, a lot of frustration and I think a lot of uh, Zoom fatigue, but without it, we would have really been in a sorry state. So I think, think having for small favors. So may I have a motion then? So moved. Second. Second. I think we're good to go with a vote there, Tony. Thanks. Councillor Anderson? Yes. Councillor Katarina? Yes. Councillor Johnson? Yes. Vice Chair Hamill? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, order number 21-070, act on the request from the Communications Committee to authorize negotiations and award to the bid for a community survey to ETC Institute. So for this, we're gonna to turn to Councillor Ken Johnson to chat about this. And That'd be me, I got my hand up. There you go. <laughs> the level said everybody, if you recall back in May, uh, we asked the full town council to authorize uh, the communication committee to undertake an RFP process for a community-wide survey. Well, the communication committee, along with the assistance of our great uh, staff, that's be Allison and Liam, that's what we did. We went out for an RFP. We had uh, three vendors uh, apply and actually a couple others uh, send back that they would have loved to have been involved. They're just they're too busy at this time and they're, or, or they're short staff. So the end of the day was we had a couple meetings, met with the vendors, and we did select one. It's called e, uh, ETC Institute. They're out of Kansas. There's their real strong suit is municipal surveys. In the last five years, they've done over 700. Looking forward to uh, working with them. If you read the RFP, we've already had a question from somebody that's very sharp and pays attention to details. It does make a mention in there of 600 responders. Uh, that information is based on a factor of seven uh, send out for the, for the survey, meaning 4,200 homes will be randomly selected and the paper survey will be mailed directly to them. The communication committee is going to make every effort 
to get the survey in the hands of everybody in town that wants to be involved. And uh, so you'll be hearing more from that. Uh, we encourage everybody to be involved. We, the town council wants to hear from you. So we're looking forward to it and I uh, hope you support this measure. And they actually came in under budget. Thank you. Any comments or questions for Councilor Johnson? John Anderson. John Anderson. It's scary when you hear your voice echo like that. Sorry, really frightening. Sorry, I, I, I'm double muted, so I'm forgetting to <laughs> unmute myself appropriately. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank um, Councillor Johnson, especially for his leadership on this. I know this has been something he's been very passionate about. And I think it's really great to see um, the company that we've selected to come forward, because I think not only do they have a really interesting methodology and approach that will help us be more targeted in policy decision making once we have the results, I think they also have some very um, creative and technical ways that's going to give us data and information through dashboarding, benchmarking, things like that, that are going to be really impressive for us to be able to kind of really understand um, the, the sentiment of, of the town. So I'm just really thankful for um, Councilor Johnson and his leadership driving this. Others, any other comments? Yeah, I'd like to add to that. I think that, uh, you know, under uh, Councilor Ken Johnson's leadership, the communications committee has made quantum leaps, uh, you know, for us as a town and engaging the public and able to enabling us to serve them better. So I think this just uh, takes us to another level. I'm very impressed with the, the process that he and the committee followed in making the selection. It was a unanimous recommendation. And, uh, and it's, a, I think, a good illustration of what we're going to put our money behind things that we think are really going to add value and improve engagement and participation of the public. So outstanding work. Thank you. Uh, may I have a motion, please? So moved. So move. Whoops, a second. It's okay. And I think we can vote on it. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. And Vice Chair Hamill? Yes. Thank you, that's unanimous. All right, we're only left with a couple of things, uh, standing and special committee reports, liaison reports. Uh, are there any councilors who'd like to report out? I know we had a pretty quiet month uh, so far in July, uh, other than preparing for this meeting. So any, any comments or activity there? Any other com counselor comments in general? Moving to item number 11. John Anderson? Yeah, sorry, I, I had some technical difficulties at the beginning of the meeting. And so I just wanted to quickly thank the, the Charter Review Committee for, for putting forward their recommendations and Councillor Katarina for her leadership and participating on that. Um, in addition to that, you know, I just wanted to talk briefly about COVID and, and vaccinations and masking. Um, you know, I, what I'm seeing on the news and what I'm hearing is the Delta variant is, is, is spreading, especially for people who are unvaccinated. And then this week, the American Academy of Pediatrics have recommended that when children go back to school in the fall, they should be wearing masks, even if they're vaccinated, anybody two or older. And I just want to voice my opinion in support of that, because I think it's really important, not only for the schools, but also for the general public safety of Scarborough that we think about protecting our children and, and making sure that they're wearing masks in the fall. I've talked to a couple of um, doctors in the area, some that are infectious disease pediatricians who, who actually live in Scarborough and they've voiced their support and opinion as well for masking in the schools. Um, I know that's not really our jurisdiction and the school board has, has a tough road ahead of them for how they wanna decide on that, but I just wanted to share with the public that I'm fully in support of masking in the schools in the fall. Thank you. Any other comments or questions uh, on that topic? Anyone want to add to that? Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd just like to say, I mean, I, re I can remember the days when uh, polio was a problem and uh, there was a much better response to that. I mean, I mean I'm dating myself and I kind of probably remember this. It was so frightening. The, 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 the prospect that if you survived, you would be in an iron lung. You know, it was just so powerful that I think there was a much different uh, national response to it. So to, to know that only 45% of, uh, of the country is currently vaccinated is horrifying. And, and uh, uh, so I, I just hope that hopefully event, that we can eventually get organized around this and show better national resolve. You know, I know at the same time, we need to respect uh, privacy rights and individual rights, but 
Um, I'm, I'm just hoping we don't have to have a horrible uh, crisis to force us, you know, to, to recognize that uh, too late. So. Last comment. I had the opportunity and actually I feel like it was the privilege of last week to go for a cruiser ride with Sergeant Craig Hebert of our police force. And uh, I did the, what would you call that? I did the four to midnight shift. It was more of a six to about 1130. Uh, I encourage all counselors, if you have the opportunity to do it. When I left, uh, uh, the sergeant told me there's definitely always an open front seat for any counselor who wants to uh, take a ride. And he, and he sincerely met, uh, meant it. It, I, I took a lot away from it. I, you know, we'll, won't talk about that, uh, you know, in, in detail. But what struck me is how professional our police force is. I mean, if you think of the, just the even some of the mundane, for lack of a better term, calls, the the dynamic interactions with our with our citizens is, uh, it, it, it was amazing to me. Uh, it, and actually, a lot of it was emotional uh, draining to me to watch. I stayed in the car. That was the rule. I couldn't get out of the car unless it was on fire. So, uh, but I definitely encourage everybody to do it. It will give you a deeper insight as, as to what our police force does. It will also help us at budget time uh, really see it from a different perspective. And uh, there, was a, there was a lot of frank discussion, and you learn a lot. So definitely reach out. They're open for it, and uh, I think you should try it. John Anderson. Uh, lastly, I just want to give um, Councillor Johnson some kudos because it looks like he and I have similar fashion sense. I can't really tell, but it looks like we're wearing the same shirt. So if nice. people want to say who wore it better, you know, let me know. So you're both lovers of technology and apparel, <laughs> certain styles. So yeah. nice going. Yeah. All right. Go. I just have to say a comment since everyone else did. Right. Um, I, just want, I just want to, again, you know, thank this council uh, for all the work. I, we did a yeoman's work in this last six months. Um, and I hope that everyone takes some time off. And I know the town's business never stops, Mr. Hall. Um, but, you know, just, just take some time for yourselves, relax, enjoy. I would say that to everybody. Uh, Summer's really short in Maine, and uh, you got to make the most of it. And this summer's been a little, kind of an interesting one, but there you go. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, the patience and fortitude of suffering through me trying to facilitate a meeting with, with very poor technology skills. So thank you for that. And uh, you know, thank you for your patience and, and participation this evening. Uh, when, with that, I'm going to ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, and let's vote on that. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Oh, yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Vice Chair Hamill? Yes, That's thank you. Thank you. Thanks, for Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.